Cold War is going to have a lot of impacts on other areas of American society. Here's a headline from the Los Angeles Times back in 1950. Two teachers balking at, uh, on replying to a query on a link with Reds. It's a weird headline. It kind of sounds on there, but it basically means in, across the United States, in addition to testing the loyalty of government workers, universities across the country began to... Uh, to require their professors and their employees to take their own loyalty tests. And if you wouldn't take them or if you wouldn't answer questions, you could be in risk of losing your job. And, and then blacklists, just like we would see in Hollywood, blacklists would start to be developed within the university communities. So this shouldn't be surprising then that that orthodox school of, of, of thought with regard to the origins of the Cold War was really the only school of thought that existed in the earliest years of the Cold War. Because what would happen to a professor that would challenge that? Well, he might end up losing his job. Yes, ma'am. This is, this is 1950, uh, but just know that universities were doing much the same as, as Hollywood was doing. So you had to toe the, the government line in universities in the early 1950s, or else you could be accused of being a communist sympathizer. In addition to universities, um, the United States Commission on Education. There was no Department of Education uh, at this time. That's not going to be born until the 1970s. So the United States Commission on Education. It's just a federal commission that, that gave advice and, and over, some oversight to, um, to schools around the country. They created what was called the Zeal for Democracy program. A curriculum that would be used uh, throughout the nation uh, in order to raise awareness about the threats of communism. And so little school children all around the country could get this information to make sure we didn't, they, they weren't going the wrong way. Okay? In 1957, in 1957, this thing flies over the United States. And that is Connor? Sputnik, very good. Uh, you guys might remember a movie from back in the day. I think some of your teachers might have possibly shown it uh, with the young Jake Gyllenhaal who, like, looking up in the sky in October of 1957, wow, that's a good name for the movie, sees this little blip and everybody's like, wow, that's very exciting because nothing had ever been put in orbit by man before until this. This is Sputnik. Sputnik is a Soviet satellite. Didn't do anything except send a little radio signal beep back to Earth. That's it. But it freaked us out. Not so much that the Soviets did it before us. That wasn't like, okay, they put a satellite in space. And it, and it seems totally innocuous, right? Innocuous, like not a big deal. How, what, what harm could this cause by putting this little radio signal satellite that's going to zoop itself around the Earth a few times until it comes crashing back to Earth? Not that big of a deal. What freaked us out was to get this thing into space, the Soviets had to have a powerful rocket, all right? And that's how you get satellites into orbit. You put them on a rocket and you get it up into space. And if the Soviets had a rocket that could put Sputnik into orbit, well, they could just, you know, change the trajectory of that rocket, and then we probably wouldn't call it a rocket anymore. We might call it a missile. And instead of putting Sputnik up in, that, up in that rocket, they could put a nuclear warhead on that rocket, or on that missile. This freaked us out. It scared us that Soviet missile technology far outpaced what we thought they could do, right? So Sputnik freaked America out, and one of our responses in the education field was for the federal government to give a new push for the teaching of math and science and foreign languages, because we didn't have enough Americans that spoke foreign languages, because we've got to do a lot of translating of documents from whether they be French or, more importantly, German at the time. Russian would be important, too, but we'd have a hard time finding a lot of Russian teachers. A, a push to spend more, uh, pay more attention to math and science education in the United States. The Cold War is also going to have a dramatic impact on the civil rights movement. Now, remember what we said that Joseph Stalin said about Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech? He said it was what? A racist call to war. And we talked last week about how, how those words are chosen purposefully. They're chosen for those people of the world who feel that they've been dominated by the Western white powers of the world, whether they be the United States or Britain or France or whatever.
And so if you look at the United States in, 19, in 1946 when the Iron Curtain speech was delivered, if you look at the United States in the 1950s, we've got some serious problems with race. Uh, throw out some things. What, what is the United States dealing with racially in the 1950s? Okay, Jim Crow laws, all right, throughout most of the American South, where there are a serious... Jim Crow, Jim Crow is just a name given to the collection of laws that would create a legal segregated society, all right? Laws that legally kept the races separate. Um, Jim Crow laws, you guys might have heard a little bit, I'm sure Ms. Ms. Hall talks a little about lynching in the American South, um, how, how, you know, there would be some like extra legal uh, uh, vigilante justice, extra legal, like going beyond the law. Vigilante justice, I, I, I believe Ms. Hall talks about the Emmett Till case, did she talk a little bit about that? About that boy who might have possibly said something to a white woman and then was ultimately murdered uh, for those comments that he made. At that, if that wasn't bad enough, the trial was a sham. Um, the, you know, everybody was in cahoot. No one was going to be punished for the murder of, of, of uh, Emmett Till. So this is the America that we were living with, a, a legally... Uh, government-enforced state segregation against African Americans. We even talked about in World War II, uh, despite the fact that we were fighting a war to stop the oppressive tyranny of totalitarian governments, right? To bring freedom to people that had lost it because the Japanese or the Germans or the Italians had overrun them. While the United States still had a legally segregated military, right? And we contrasted that with the Brazilian army that, that was integrated at the time. So, Joseph Stalin knows this. He knows what the United States is all about. He knows the issues that we have. And so you begin to get a lot of propaganda coming out of the Soviet Union that highlighted the fact that under the banner of proletarianism, uh, pro, pro, uh, the proletariat, these are the workers of the world, uh, as that's the word Karl Marx used, the proletariat, um, as opposed to the business class, the owners who were the, anybody know, the opposite of the proletariat? Say it out loud. Yeah, I'm talking to you. The bourgeoisie, very good. So uh, bourgeoisie is the, the, the wealthy upper crust that owns society, the means of production in society. The proletariat are the workers. And here you guys are, you have a hard time making it out, but here's a white guy under the banner of proletarianism. There's a not-so-white guy, possibly an Asian guy. There's a, there's a black guy. All of them marching together um, under this common flag. Here's another one. Uh, this says under, under capitalism and under communism. And here, there's an African-American um, who's like kind of underneath the Statue of Liberty here, uh, but it, you guys can't make it out so well here, but he's kind of beaten, obviously tied up, uh, looks like he's been hung, there's, there's blood on, on the side of his head here. Uh, he's a victim of, of lynching in, in America, and like, like one of hundreds and hundreds of people that suffered that fate. When under communism, Everybody's cool, and there's all different kinds of people in this crowd, and they're all together, and they look like well put together, and they look successful, um, and, and everybody's good. So Joseph Stalin is going to try to, to let the world, and certainly let his people know, and let the communists of the world know, but also propaganda is going to make its way out west to let African Americans in the United States know that there's better out there for them, that the United States maybe is not the best way to go. Well, what does the United States government do in this, this situation? We've got a big problem. We're trying to talk about the United States being the, the ideal for freedom and democracy, right? But we don't do, because this is real, like, they're not making this stuff up. We were, like, condoning, basically. We weren't stopping this kind of stuff from happening. So the federal government's got a problem. How are we going to win the Cold War when at home we are keeping our, our people, or at least a large minority population uh, keeping them down. So we would see during the Cold War, during these early years of the Cold War in the 1950s and into the 1960s, a parallel with the rise of the Civil Rights Movement. Now I'm not saying that the Civil Rights Movement would have, wouldn't have happened without the Cold War tensions, all right? Nor am I saying that, these, that it was all of the federal government that, that was like doing the Civil Rights Movement, all the Civil Rights uh, advancements uh, they certainly weren't all driven by the federal government. In fact, most weren't. But what you are going to see is a federal government in the 1950s and early 60s that is much more willing to support the idea of civil rights in the United States. 
So while the civil rights movement, I think, begins with individuals, like just on the ground, it's a grassroots push, the federal government doesn't, like it had in previous times, it doesn't stop it from happening. And in fact, it sometimes it supports the civil rights movement. And so we're going to talk about it, just a couple things. Um, this is, um, actually before we go to there, let's talk about uh, the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case. You guys probably have heard of this one before. Since 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in the United States that as long as facilities were equal, they could be separated by race. That was done under what Supreme Court case? Anyone recall this one? Look at you guys go. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. So that made separate but equal the law of the land. But after 60 years of separate but equal, it was clear to everybody that separate was rarely, if ever, equal. All right? And this, this idea would be challenged in Topeka, Kansas by a little girl and her family that was supported by a group called the NAACP. If you guys are familiar with the NAACP, it's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. You don't have to memorize that acronym. You can just hear it. Um, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. This is an organization that was born in the early 20th century. That's why, like, even in the name NAACP, where we say colored people in that name, we don't use that language anymore. It, it is not politically correct. It's not acceptable. If you hear someone, like, saying that kind of stuff, you've got to tell, like, your racist grandma to stop it. it. We don't do that anymore. Or you look around and say, wow, how did I end up at this Klan meeting? Because <laughs> people don't use these terms anymore. It's not acceptable. Though the organization, the NAACP, has kept its its original name. The NAACP was born in the early 1900s. Uh, one of its founders was a guy named W.E.B. Du Bois. I think you guys are familiar with him, right? Yeah. Last year you probably talked about Du Bois and Booker T. Washington and how they had two different views as to how civil rights issues should be solved. W.E.B. Du Bois was a lawyer. He was a, like the first guy to get a law degree from Harvard University. First, Af not first guy, first African-American man to get a law degree from, uh, uh, the, from Harvard. So Du Bois uh, and others start the NAACP as a legal advocacy group for African Americans. By the 1950s, the NAACP is bigger and it's stronger, and they take this case in Topeka, Kansas. They are going to support Linda Brown, this little girl, that doesn't want to walk past the white school as she goes on to her, her black school. And they would argue in the Brown versus Board of Education case, even more so than just schools, they would argue that all of these separate but equal laws, since Plessy versus Ferguson, were inherently unequal. And famously, you don't need to write about this, but just hear it. Uh, famously, in this case, Linda Brown um, was, was asked, um, along with, with other children, they were given little dolls that they could play with. And they were asked whether well, little white dolls and little black dolls, which doll they thought was like prettier, or which doll they thought was smarter, which doll would they rather play with? Yes, ma'am? Absolutely. They would have, um, which one was like, they would have a range of different skin tones of these like little dolls, yes. but like pictures of like little girls okay. or boys. And they would like, on a scale, like pick which ones were the smartest. They'd say like, the, the girls that had yellow skin would be the smartest, and then like the people who were like dumb would be like the black people. Yeah, okay. And, and so, so this was a reality. And the idea of, of, of studies like this, and the idea of the lawyers in the Brown case was that keeping Linda Brown and other African-American children separate made them feel inferior. Like when there was a place that you just couldn't go, but you wanted to go, they wouldn't let you in, it made them feel inferior. So, with the, so the Supreme Court heard this case. It made it all the way up to the highest court of the land. The Supreme Court heard it, and they ruled in favor of Linda Brown and her NAACP lawyers. And so the idea of separate but equal was at least at that point, eradicated by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, that doesn't mean Jim Crow South ends with that one decision. Because remember, the Supreme Court, their job is to interpret the law. And now they've done that. But now it's the executive branch's job, the, the President of the United States, the executive branch's job to enforce that law. And that's not easy, because you've got an American South that is still wanting to enforce the ideas of segregation. So as time goes on, we're going to see, okay, we have an example of the Supreme Court decision that supports some 
improvements in civil rights, but we're going to have to have the President of the United States step in. And we're going to see that in a couple cases. Let's look here. Um, eggnog. eggnog? Oh, oh, wow. I didn't even notice. Oh, my gosh. This weekend, I was in Costco, and I was like, that eggnog looks really good. And I bought a jug of eggnog, and I wonder if I just, in my, in my subconscious, I noticed that advertisement, the power of advertisements, right? Um, so anyway, um, we're going to talk about that in a second. But right here, uh, this is a group of students known as the Little Rock Nine. Uh, and the Little Rock Nine were, were a group of nine African-American high school students who were going to go to the Little Rock Central High School, previously an all-white segregated school. And the state of Arkansas, this happened in the capital of Arkansas, the state wanted to keep them out. They wanted to maintain their segregated schools. It's in 1957. President Eisenhower, enforcing the Supreme Court's decision and enforcing the right of these students to go to their local public school, sent in the national, or sent in, pardon me, federal troops. So he sent the army, which is kind of crazy, right? Sent the army to Arkansas to escort these students into school. And can you imagine what these kids must have gone through and the, and the looks and the jeers that they must have gotten uh, not being accepted at all by, by the local community, obviously. But the federal government would support this. Because how could the federal government not support this? when it's trying to fight and wage a cold war against a nation who is arguing that you are racist and you are hypocritical. So the federal government's got to support stuff like this, and they do. We do not want to think, though, that all um, of the, the civil rights improvements during this era uh, was because of the federal government. Uh, this is a, a picture of African Americans boarding a bus in Little Rock, or not, in Montgomery, Alabama, pardon me, in Montgomery, Alabama. We all know the story, of course, in 1955 of Rosa Parks, um, who, again, Rosa Parks worked for the local Montgomery office of the NAACP, all right? Rosa Parks was a plant. Rosa Parks was picked to violate the law in Montgomery, Alabama, that African Americans could not sit at the front of the bus. She was chosen because she was a good person. There was nothing in Rosa Parks' character that would ever make somebody think that person is, is a bad person, okay? So Rosa Parks was just a wonderful human being. And how could anybody fault her for, for doing what she would do? This is the idea. So Rosa Parks was chosen to... It, it, so the story is not Rosa Parks was just tired after a long day of work and she sat down and she didn't want to move to the back of the bus. Rosa Parks knew when she got on the bus where she was going to sit. Rosa Parks knew that she was going to be told to move. Rosa Parks knew that she was not going to move. Rosa Parks knew that she was going to be arrested because this is violating Montgomery law. Rosa Parks knew that the NAACP was going to defend her. All right? So, so the story of, of Rosa Parks is an NAACP challenge to local law. What comes out of that is the Martin Luther King-supported Montgomery bus boycott. Um, the the African-Americans of Montgomery, Alabama, who was, uh, was a sizable minority within, within Montgomery, and the majority users of the local bus system, the African-Americans of Montgomery, Alabama, just boycotted their, the, the town buses uh, in 1955. And this is led by, started by Rosa Parks, obviously, in the NAACP, but the boycott's led by Martin Luther King. Uh, we're also going to see a series of sit-ins that happened throughout the South, but most famously in Greensboro, North Carolina, where African-American students will refuse to leave the, uh, the, uh, the counter, the lunch counter, in, in this diner, for example, or in many other diners, where they weren't permitted to sit. They had to go towards the back of the restaurant. These were for white patrons only. And they would sit, and they would stay, and they would refuse to leave. And again, this is just another example of the civil rights movement, but in previous times, the federal government might have been supportive of local communities enforcing their own segregationist laws. But now we're starting to see the federal government step in more uh, through the Supreme Court or through, for example, Eisenhower's case of... of supporting African Americans and gaining their civil rights. We will see more of this as we get into the 1960s. Um, 
President Kennedy uh, and, his, and his successor, Lyndon Johnson, will pass a Civil Rights Act in 1963 and a Voting Rights Act in 1965 that guarantees the right to vote for African Americans, eliminates things like literacy tests that some South, uh, Southern communities would use. And again, here's just more support of the federal government for civil rights causes. Now, this doesn't mean that everything was perfect in the American South now for African Americans. Because some southern states would double down on their persecution for African, of African Americans. For example, the NAACP in Alabama would be outlawed. And some started to link the activists in the civil rights movement with being communist sympathizers and subversives themselves. Like the idea that the civil rights movement is like changing the very fabric of what the United States had long been. And if you were a racist American uh, in, in the 1950s or 60s, you saw this as a dramatic change that was destroying the America that you thought you knew and loved. And at times the FBI even stepped into this, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the federal government's police force. And throughout the, 19, throughout the end of the 1950s and into the 1960s, up until his death, the Federal Bureau of Investigation had an open file on, on Martin Luther King Jr. and had, had bugged his, uh, his phone, had wiretapped his phones, um, and, and listened to his, his personal conversations, and um, at times intercepted letters, found out a lot of dirt on Martin Luther King Jr., a lot of unflattering things about him. Um, so the point is, the Civil Rights Movement and the Cold War really get up and running at the same time. I would argue that the Cold War is going to help the federal government push along issues of the civil rights activists, all right? But most of these are starting from just individuals on their own, all right?